And we're live. This is episode 22 of Porterhouse and Teal Live. And I'm here with Jason Sparks from Kentucky Sustainable Living. And Jason is back for a second appearance. He was actually my second guest on this broadcast. So he's coming back as a as a re, as a repeat, but for those that don't know what Kentucky Sustainable Living is and who Jason Sparks is, why don't you give those folks a little bit of an introduction into KSL and what what your group's all about? Hey, everybody! Uh, I'm Jason with Kentucky Sustainable Living. We uh, we've got a group in Kentucky. Originally, we started in just in Kentucky, a group of like-minded individuals in uh in the homesteading and preparedness aspects of everything <coughs> there were a few of us that were like hey we need to get something going and build build a network and build a community in kentucky uh so it started off just a handful of guys scattered out through the state so uh right now we uh we cracked a thousand people on our facebook page a couple weeks ago and it just keeps growing uh, but we've got another another inner circle of people that we've really gotten to know uh, that that inner circle of people, we invite them to our uh, training events and processing classes, stuff like that. Uh, we do. I mean, we butchered a cow here at my house and I'll have, you know, and send out the invite. Whoever's in that inner circle. Hey, you're welcome to come. We'll teach you how to process a beef. We'll do pig processing, chickens. Uh, we just do all kinds of stuff. Anything, uh, we've done two uh, tree guild classes and food force classes here at my house. It's I send out the invite, hey, Saturday, 8 o'clock, come down. We're going to plant a food forest and show you how to do it. So it's uh, it's a cool deal. We, we all learn kind of a value for value thing. You know, uh, I know a lot in the building aspects and everything. I'm learning more uh, into the permaculture realm. But if somebody, we've got some nurse practitioners, so they'll come down and teach us some stuff for that. And then they'll trade off some of their medical knowledge to, and I'll trade off some of my building knowledge or knowledge and something else. So it's kind of a value for value thing. Everybody gets a little something out of it and you get to, you get to build a community with people. Uh, and then we've kind of expanded on, we've got people in Indiana and Tennessee now, uh, Got a, somebody in Ohio, got some guys in West Virginia, too. So it's kind of grown past the state of Kentucky to almost kind of a regional thing. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's kind of what we're doing, building building a community and kind of an underground trading network also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I'd asked you this before, and, and it's something that it's um, interesting to me is just managing that community. Cause that's a lot of people, you know, when you start getting a lot of people, thousand people in a group, you know, there's, yeah. there's always the, the challenge of, you know, who's, who's really actively participating and who's just kind of there, you know? So I don't know what, what percentage would you say are like really actively participating members that you have? It's, it's pretty much the 90, the 90, 10 rule. You know, you got 90% of the people don't do a lot of stuff and 10% pull are super active in everything. So, and you've got, I understand people are busy. You know, you've got baseball, you've got school, you've got work, you've got your farm, everything else. So some people are super busy with that. I get busy with it too and don't have time to do all the stuff I want to. Mm -hmm. But generally th there's a good active portion of our members that uh, are there. I I've got guys right now I could call and say, hey, my cows have got out, my sheep are out. I need some help getting these things in there on the highway. And I know of five or six guys that will be here within 15 to 20 minutes to come help me. Or there's guys, every time we have something at my house or have an event, I know there's seven or eight guys, men or women, that will be here guaranteed. So, yeah. and, and it varies too. I understand, you know, some of the people are two and a half, three hours away. They can't take a whole you know, Saturday just to come down, uh, just to learn to plant a food for us. So we split the state up into seven communities. So, uh, each community, we try to get them to hold a monthly meeting to where everybody's a little bit closer, you know, to where maybe it's only an hour to run over to the event. And, uh, I tell them, I'm like, just have something, you know, 
do just meet up with everybody and have a stinking potluck just to get to know the people. So we do that. We're trying to do one to two uh, big group events, like a statewide event where we have it for like a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday. And we've had those before, and it, it turns out great. We've had several at my shop. Uh, the guys camp out and they stay in the shop. I mean, most of the time we'll have it when it's cold outside. I've got a wood burning stove in the shop. Everybody pulls out a cot. We keep the shop at, you know, 65 degrees and everybody's happy. And we just line out speakers from the group. You know, if somebody wants to talk about herbal medicine, that person will give them, we'll give them three or four hours to talk about herbal medicine. Uh, somebody wants to talk about homestead security. They'll get three or four hours to talk about homestead security in depth. Uh, we'll do communications, some ham radio stuff, and just just kind of make a weekend, a small, I guess a small mini festival for our members. And, you know, kind of if somebody wants to present something, hey, jump up there, you know, at the table and start talking about it. We've got a whiteboard that you can draw and do whatever you want to with it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, heck, if you had... 10% of a thousand, that's a hundred people. So, you know, you yeah. guys are well on your way to having a pretty actively, um, you know, active group of members and, and that's super cool. And the only way to really build community is to actually go out there and do it. And then to encourage, you know, that the development of that. So um, yeah. I got some folks here in the, in the chat. I wanted to just acknowledge and say, Hey to um, Bruce from Debris custom leather and dog creeks in the house, chase peoples. What's up chase. And Grumpy, uh, Grumpy's in the house. Um, Happy Days Farm from Australia. Man, that's pretty cool. Oh, you're that's getting a, out there now. Man, you're that's international. That's other side of the pond, I guess they call that. <laughs> welcome, yeah, Bruce, to, uh, welcome to the broadcast. That's cool. And, and bird ladies Bruce. in the house. So, Bruce is one of those people. guys. What's that? Bruce is one of those guys that uh, he's in our group with us. So. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a good dude, man. Bruce is a good guy. Um, I had him on the program and uh, corresponded with him. And I look forward to being able to go down in Tennessee here, or excuse me, into uh, Kentucky in October for you guys' festival and get an opportunity to, to visit again. But uh, let's see, Shelly's in the house. Grumpy Acres, Skane's girl, how you doing? Chuck Peoples. So yeah, man, that's cool. I, I really like, like to... Uh, like to hear about that and see how it's developed. Let me ask you, where do you see, uh, where do you see your group in five years? What KSL, what do you, what do you hope to see in five years? I hope we'll all still be here in five years and it's not hell on wheels and anarchy like everybody thinks it's going to be. But if it, uh, if, if everything's still status quo and, you know, hopefully everything will be better as far as the economy and stuff like that, inflation and everything, uh, in five years, I, I would love to have 5,000 members in our Facebook group and, you know, maybe five to 600 people across the state that we could count on. Uh, and then with, with starting and doing our festival, I would love to have two festivals a year, one in the spring and one in the fall, and grow this festival to where we could have, I mean, I, I'm a numbers guy. You know, if, if we could have 2,000 people come through this festival in five years, I mean, that's, that's an awesome feat right there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I look at uh, Warren County, the county that we're having it in, there's a, almost 140,000 people in Warren County where we're going to have it. If you can draw 1% of that population, one, there's got to be at least 1% of Warren County that's interested in, in preparedness or homesteading lifestyle, you know, in that in one of those genres that's 1400 people that you could pull just from one county so mm -hmm. that's that's what i'm looking at is to expand it uh shelly and jake and i kind of got the idea planted to us from somebody they're like hey you ought to do a festival in kentucky and i, I kind of blew it off and like yeah whatever that that's too much crap to do but uh we we're kind of like hey, we ought to do this. And it just, it, it shot out from there. And we're like, we can really do this once we started looking at venues and stuff like that. And the support has been awesome so far from everybody that's coming. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a real deal. So it's, yeah, well, let, well let's, talk, let's talk about it, Jason. Um, why don't you tell folks what the festival 
is going to consist of and where it's going to be held and all of those things. We'll get right to it and, and uh, talk about this. Yeah. Fast. I'm, I'm looking forward to going down there and, and uh, participating. And yeah, the, uh, the festival, the festival is uh, October 27th, 28th and 29th. Uh, the 27th that Friday, we're going to have paid classes. Eric is going to be teaching a uh, plant guild class and Eric, I'll let you talk about it in a minute. Uh, Chuck Peoples is doing a homestead medical class. That's going to be about an eight hour class. Uh, lunch is provided for both these classes in the price. Chuck will be doing an eight hour homestead medicine class. And then Sunday, he's also going to do a stop the bleed class, which the stop the bleed class is about a three to four hour class, which is uh, stopping traumatic bleeding injuries. So it's handy. That's something that on the homestead, I did a short the other day. I was out cutting a tree that fell. Put the chainsaw right there. Two things you need when you're chainsawing. You need, of course, you need your PPE. You need some gloves, a helmet, earplugs, but you also need your scrunch and you need a tourniquet. I mean, that's one of the things. Chuck, Chuck will go over all that stuff. With those classes, you'll be proficient in stopping an arterial bleed and stopping somebody from bleeding out. So that Friday, we're having those two classes. And then uh, Saturday and Sunday is going to be vendors, speakers, and processing. And I've got, I've got a whole list. Uh, and I'm just going to hit some of our speakers right now. Of course, Eric, you're going to speak. Uh, Bruce DeVries is going to talk. He's going to be talking about biochar. We've got uh, Aaron T. Scott. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Aaron T. Scott, but uh, look at her YouTube channel. It's the real Aaron T. Scott. Uh, let me see. Ch of course, Chuck Peoples will be talking. Uh, Greg Braun, is, uh, he's real good friends with Greg Judy, and he does regenerative uh, grazing. And he lives, he only lives about 30 minutes from us. He's going to be there talking about pasture management. Uh, Jake Drum from Drum Medical will be there. Uh, Emily Rock, she's local. She lives about 20 minutes from me, and she's got a, a homestead, and she does a lot of dairy work with dairy cattle. She will have one of her dairy cows there all weekend doing demonstrations on milking for homestead milking. Uh, of course, Grumpy will be there. Uh, Tag. Life Done Free tag will be there. Uh, Matt Hunley was also going to be there talking about water catchment and some other things. Uh, Andy, Andy from uh, Andy's Little Homestead will be there. He is a big guy on Facebook, so you might want to check him out. Uh, Jeff Smith, Everyday Prepper, will be there. Uh, Enos is a uh, trapper from a few miles away from me. He's going to be talking about trapping. Uh, and then there's some other stuff. And actually, one of the surprise guys that's going to come, and he just said it on his pimp cast, Billy will be there from Permapastures. So Billy's going to be there. The, that kind of rounds out the speakers that I, that I jotted down before this. Uh, we've got some huge, big vendors and stuff like that that are going to be there. Uh, what else do you want to know? I know I, I know I said a mouthful just now. <laughs> No, that's that's uh, you, you covered quite a bit. What what vendors do you have coming? We got off the top. You, I think you had mentioned something about a sawmill or something. Didn't you have somebody coming with a sawmill? We're, try, we're trying to get somebody with a sawmill. So if mm -hmm. somebody knows somebody with a sawmill that want to set it up, I would love to have a sawmill out there. We've contacted Wood Miser and some other sawmill people, but they hadn't got back with us yet. But I know. Uh, Nifty Nifty Hoops out of Michigan is going to bring and set up a greenhouse for us in the arena. So we'll have them. Uh, Tough Sheds will be there. Tough Sheds is a national uh, shed company. So they're going to bring one of their sheds up, and they're going to bring some chicken coops up. And uh, so you can, you can look. I know a lot of people are doing tiny houses. So I'm like, that's a perfect market for you to – for people to look at the sheds and the quality of their sheds and be like, hey, maybe I want – tough shed to do a shed for me they'll be there uh bobcat of bowling green is also going to be there bobcat now has a line of mowers i didn't know they had a line of mowers till i went in there and looked so 
they're going to have mowers. They're going to have tractors. Uh, they'll have excavators and skid loaders there. Uh, there's Grumpy. Of course, Grumpy will be selling the best freeze-dried food on the market. He will be there, and they'll be there selling that. Uh, there's just there's a whole list, and I've got uh, – Bruce, of course, Bruce will be there, DeVries. He's going to have leather goods, stuff like that. Our vendors are going to kind of range from, you know, handmade stuff as far as your soaps and stuff like that, all the way up to bigger stuff like pieces of equipment. Everything and in between, we're, we're hoping to get uh, an ammunition manufacturer to come in and uh, sell ammunition. So there, there's a ton of stuff that's going to go on. I, I don't have all our vendors right in front of me, but uh, there's a bunch of them. Well, EM, EMP Shield will be there too. This well, guy. I can't, see, I can't see a bunch of the comments. Look at this guy right here, man. This guy, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. What are we going to do? With I, think he, I think he's dyslexic on that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so so where's the venue at? Let's talk the about venue, that. Where, where, where is it at? Is it going to be in a field someplace or is it? No, uh, it's in Bowling Green, Kentucky at the Ag. It's at Western Kentucky University's Ag Expo Center. It's uh, Everything is inside. The only thing that will be outside is some of the equipment that they're going to have on display. They have... Uh, they have a huge arena. The arena, the arena where the vendors will be set up is a hundred by 200 arena inside climate controlled to tell you how big the space is. It'll seat, I think 2,700 people in thick seating. So that's how big the arena is. We've got our uh, one area where the speakers will be is a sales arena where you can run animals through but it's got three, 300 plus thick seating area. So when you're, when some of the people are presenting and speaking, 300 people can sit in there. So, and then we've got another uh, holding area where uh, we'll have our dairy cow at, and then that's where we'll be doing the uh, pig and chicken processing at. Very so, cool. Yeah. Uh, Very cool. And uh, the cost for the event? The cost to come into the event is free for everybody. So there's, there's no, there's no, no, no payment, no registering, uh, no fees for coming to that. We're not selling tickets. The event is free. We do ask that you go to our website and register for the event just to sign up on the email list to give us some kind of idea of how many people will be there. We're not going to spam you. All you do is sign up. The website is KentuckySustainableLiving.com. So it, it's, it's a big help for us is if you can go and register and say, hey, yes, I'm coming because Western does the uh, all the concessions and the catering for that. And they like to know a number of how many people they can expect to come. So there will be food provided there. Uh, Western, like I said, Western takes care of all that. So and they've got some stinking good food, too. Yeah, I put I put a link to to all of that in the description to this, um, both to the website and then also to the class that I'll be putting on. And um, I'm excited about the class because it's it's limited. It's yes. a pre pretty small class. There's only going to be 30 slots. So I feel as though the folks that will be signing up for that will have an opportunity to have a little bit more of an intimate experience as far as kind of a one on one type of a uh, tutorial where yeah. we're going to get an opportunity to go out and hands-on put in a fruit tree guild, several of them, actually. I think we're going to do like three or maybe five different trees. I was planning on between three and five. It, okay. depends, on, it depends on how much space they're going to allow us, and we won't sure. know that until a little bit beforehand. Right, but we'll, we'll get an opportunity to go out there, and you'll see that firsthand, so it will start to put things into more of a clear picture for you as far as how to – not only select those plants, but then place them in a fruit tree guild. And, you know, prior to doing that, we're going to spend some time in the classroom. And I want to talk uh, pretty extensively about how and best to build your soil and then ultimately how to create an edible food landscape, um, ultimately kind of leading to a, a food forest. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things to consider in that. And I'm looking forward to being able to try to set you guys up for success. So, 
If that's something that you're interested in, coming down to Kentucky, hanging out with me, hanging out with Jason, hanging out with all these other cool people, certainly go into the description of this and, and all of that stuff's right there. You can click and sign up for the class um, straight away from there or, um, yeah, just go on the website and check it out. Yeah, and I, I think the class is going to be super good. I've, mm -hmm. I've learned a lot about the, uh, the tree guilds and everything, and we've planted – You've seen videos of it. We planted a whole food forest around each tree. We did its own guild. And I've got uh, about half, probably a third of my driveway now is all planted in tree guilds now. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it's a super good class. Uh, it's going to be like, like you said, Eric, you know, some classroom stuff, the nuts and the bolts explaining why we do this. And then you're going to see that. And if it, it'll really make sense once you go out there and you're actually digging in the dirt and, you know, digging in the dirt, putting the plants in, putting the cardboard down, putting the wood chips down, all that, it's going to be a hands-on class. So bring your, bring your gloves and some work clothes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, like I say, I look forward to having the opportunity to, to work one-on-one -on -one with folks that have questions and try to get them answered so that, you know, you can be set up for, success on your own property. Um, you know, I know we talk a lot about preparedness and storing food in buckets and all that sort of stuff in these types of channels, but, you know, it's pretty cool to have stuff where you can walk right out your door and, you know, walk right into a food forest of your own. And, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's one of those things where it's an either, or it's, it's both, you know, yeah. it, not only that, plus, you know, livestock as well. That's, that's all part of preparedness. So, um, I'm looking forward to being able to come down there and, and uh, share some of that with you guys. Yeah, and it, it, it's set up as a uh, as a perennial system. Uh, I, I went before this, before it got dark, and before I got on here, I ran down into my food forest and I picked I picked a solo cup of strawberries just in five minutes. Grabbed those, uh, and I've literally done nothing to those strawberries after I planted them, except for put a little compost around each one. Yeah, just a handful of compost. Uh, blueberries, we've got just loads of blueberries that are going to be coming in pretty soon. And I've literally, other than planting those, the only thing I did was go and put like a like half a five gallon bucket of compost around it. So, and then next year it'll be the same thing. You'll go down there and weed around it a little bit, throw some compost on it a couple times, and you've got blueberries. So it's. Yeah that's the nice thing about it is it's just it's food all the time for you and you don't have to work that much for it yeah perennial based systems are, are kind of the way to go i mean we plant a lot of annuals as gardeners but um, if you can establish your soil um, system and you can get things established on a perennial basis then it's it's like a no-brainer um, rebecca just made just this evening she just made some uh, loganberry jam and uh yeah, it's just that it's that time of year. It's harvest time for, for those sorts of things. And um, like I say, that's what part of this class will help, you know, move you guys toward if you're looking to, uh, to you know, learn about that. So oh, yeah. um, hey, I was, yeah. just well, like, like building like build your soil. We're on a heavy red clay is what we are here. I, I've got maybe two or three inches of topsoil starting off with and the rest on down is just red clay. We put cardboard down, put about six to eight inches of wood mulch on top and planted our stuff. Before, I could not take a pitchfork and drive it maybe two inches in the ground. I could take a pitchfork out there and almost bury it in the ground, just not even after a year is how, much, is how loose that soil is now and how much more life is in there. You can go in there and dig out and there's just earthworms everywhere. It's amazing. Amazing, ain't it? Yeah, it's crazy. So, I mean, that that's some of the stuff you can turn this crappy clay soil into something that will actually grow for you. Yeah. And it's proven. I mean, it's a proven system that it works. You bet. Hey, I was going to ask you, man, I, I didn't even ne never notice this. I'm going to change the subject. Um, but when I, when I was putting together the thumbnail for this broadcast, I noticed on your, your logo, there's three Fs. What is that, man? It's a... It's faith, family, and friends. Gotcha. So, gotcha. One, yeah, I had one never of our guys, yeah, one of our guys came up with the logo, and it just kind of stuck. And I'm like, let's keep that logo. So, yeah, yeah I I just had never noticed the three Fs, and and when I noticed that, I was like, oh, I got to ask him about that. So, yeah. So that's pretty uh pretty cool. 
So what's, uh, I guess, what's been your biggest challenge, man, in, in KSL? You know, you started, you started this thing, what, uh, about a year or two ago? It's been about a little over two years ago, something like that. Yeah. The, the, the hardest part was, was first starting out and finding guys that were into it. Uh, that, that was the hardest part is getting members in, trying to keep some people active. Some, some of your members active. That's part, that's some of the hardest stuff in it. But mm -hmm. as it goes, there, there's going to be people that are more involved and people that aren't as involved, just like in any organization. But, uh, <clears throat> You take those people that are involved and those are the ones that you put your energy in and you run with. So that's, but the hardest part's just actually starting it. You, you can have great ideas in your head all day long, but if you don't act on those, all they are is just a good idea fairy is all yeah. it is. So put foot to butt and do it. Yeah, I think, you know, even if you don't have active members, let's say you don't have people that are actively participating, um, but just to have them in your system as a resource. Yes. So have you guys created a resource directory, something to the extent that, oh, hey, this person is a mechanic. This person is a, you know, whatever. This person's a carpenter. <laughs> this person's a blacksmith. Have you guys created a, like a, a, an ERD, a, a resource directory? We, not, not formally, but we've got everybody in a chat to where you can pull it up. And most of the time when a new member comes in, they'll introduce themselves. They'll say, Hey, I'm Joe Blow. I um, live in so-and-so County. You know, this is what we do. My full-time job is a car mechanic. So people kind of check that out. And a, a lot of times people will come in and they're like, Hey, uh, I've got a question about my cars doing this. So I can steer them sometimes because I know pretty much what everybody does in the group. So I can be like, hey, Joe is a mechanic. You might want to hit him up and send him a message and ask him about your car. So we we do have a uh, an online spreadsheet that our members can put in. If uh, like Shelly, Shelly sells soap. So she can put in there, hey, I've got soap for sale. So if you're in the group and you're like, hey, I want soap from one of my members, you can contact Shelly and say, hey, hey, Shelly, I want six bars of soap. So if somebody's got pigs for sale, you know, they can put it up there. Hey, we've got six pigs for sale. One of the other members can go in there and look on the spreadsheet and they're like, hey, you know, Joe's got six pigs for sale. I want two of them. And they'll be ready in another month so they can contact them and uh, they can trade out like, Shelly and I are trading out. She's trading me a boar for a uh, lamb. So I'm giving her one of this year's lambs and she's giving me one of her boars. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of trading in the stuff. Some of the guys are trading. Uh, oh, they mentioned it uh, this morning in chat. One of the guys has got a, bu a bunch of uh, fertile guinea eggs. So one of the guys is coming over and getting guinea eggs that he's going to hatch out. So the, we trade in between the group a lot. And yeah, I think I think that's I think that's probably just as valuable as is having active members, quite honestly, because a lot of a lot of what needs to happen, at least in my way of thinking from a group standpoint, is just establishing and 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 cultivating the cult, the counter economy, you know, yeah. um, doing business with people who are like minded and doing business outside of the system, I think, is a very important way that we can do that and just if you had people that were willing to do business with one another that that in and of itself is is super super valuable you know they don't oh, have yeah. to necessarily show up to meetings and and do all these other things but if they're there to be able to be a part of that mag that mutual assistance group then yeah you know that's that's money in the bank right there Oh yeah. And I mean, there we've got members from all, all walks of life, everything from nurse practitioners to mechanics to guys that just work in factories, you know, and retired military guys. Uh, I mean, and each one plays its own part. I've, I've had so many people say, Hey, I don't really have anything to bring to the group. And I flat out tell them, I'm like, if you want to be in the group, you've got something to give to us. So no matter what your background is, no matter your physical ability, anything you've got something that you can bring to the group yeah so yeah, i mean my, sure. my whole opinion my whole opinion on it on a lot of the stuff is if you're still walking the earth god's got a purpose for you if he didn't have a purpose for you he'd just go ahead and kill you so i mean everybody's got a purpose the and, reaper the reaper yeah. shows up <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. Now there's a few people that I'm like, I don't know why God has got a purpose for this dude, but okay, well, I'm not going to question it. Yeah. Hey, man. Well, hey, uh, let me ask you this now. What what concerns you? I like to know what what people are concerned about. You know, in the prepper sphere, in in just the general life sphere. What what is your what is your overarching concern that you have with what you see is coming? I'm I'm self employed. I'm a contractor, so I'm I'm only as good as my last job, essentially. So I I lived through and worked through 2008, 2010, all the housing crisis and all that kind of crap. The bottom the bottom fell out bad on you. You know when you went from doing all these jobs to scrapping. You know, we, we were living the high life. It was like, man, this money's never going to end. We were doing thousands of dollars every week. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, you're fighting for a $500 job. And it's like, holy crap. That That's one of the things that concerns me. I, I don't get a paycheck every week. You know, if you get paid on a job, it's got to last you to you get paid on your next job. I mean, knock on wood. I stay busy with the contracting, but that that's always in the back of my mind. You know, the housing market inflation. I mean, you look at it now when you go to buy groceries, you know, you used to get a whole stinking cart full of stuff for, you know, 300 bucks. And now you get three or four bags for 300 bucks. And it's like, you know, this is crazy. Uh, and everybody's talking now how the banks are going to go under, you know, this kind of stuff and, you know, get your money out of the banks, this and that. That kind of concerns me. Uh, a lot of it's the financial aspect is kind of what concerns me. But mm -hmm. but my and a guy said one time he was like, you can't control what's going on overseas. You can't really control what's going on in D.C. So, but I can control what's going on, you know, in my county a little bit more. So I don't put a huge big aspect and, and a whole lot of emphasis on what's happened in the whole world. I've looked more of what's going on 20 miles from my house because I can control that a little bit more. Right. Well, uh, you know, I guess my follow up question to that is, you know, obviously there's things that are happening that we have no ability to change or to influence. Um, but if you recognize there's something that's of concern, what is the thing that you can do to make it not a concern? What can you do to, to make that so that the concerns that you have go away? You can, you can pull if, yourself if any, out. If anything. Well, as far as the financial part of it, pay off as much debt as you can. I mean, don't, don't, yeah, it'd be cool to have a new $90,000 Duramax or a $100,000 Duramax with 35 inch tires and all this crap and be able to pull 50,000 pounds. But hey, you know, my 2015 half ton Silverado does there, it pulls my work truck, my work trailer around fine and it's not nowhere near $90,000. But, uh, you know, don't, don't go load up on a bunch of debt, pay everything off as much as you can. Uh, have grow grow your own food and pull yourself out of the system as much as you can. Don't don't the less you rely on the system, the better off you're going to be. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's kind of what I would like to do. That's what we've kind of set ourselves up to do here. Even mm -hmm. on our small property, we could we could close the gates and be pretty good for a long time. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool, man. Um, man, I wish I had a 2015 truck. <laughs> I only I only bought it because I blew my old Ford up. And I was like, I need yeah. something else. I think I'm driving a 2005, I think it is, but uh yeah, it's all good, man. It, it I, paid I, off, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. I, I I tell you what I would love to have is an old 73 power stroke. I got one. Yep. I would kill I bought I, I bought would... mine in 2000 and it was used. It had 23,000 miles on it and I paid uh out the door, $27,000. Yeah. I got a pretty damn good deal on that truck. Somebody took it back and, and I got a seven seven 7.3 power stroke in the garage right now. And I just use it to pull a cattle trailer. Or if we need to put six people in seat belts, you know, we got some way to do that. But oh yeah, um, those, those are great motors. Those are great I, motors, man. None of the emissions crap either. That's what I like about it. Yeah. Yeah. Those that's, are what's great killed, motors. that's what's killed the diesel engines is all the emissions. Yeah. I mean, you, you, and I hate to get down that rabbit hole, but man, 
uh, I would not have a new diesel engine. I would not have a new diesel truck, period. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't think I will if, unless I can pay cash for it. It's just I, I can't see going into that. It's amazing to see the inflation of what things are costing these days. It's it's crazy. Oh, yeah. But, well, um, when, when I had that Ford diesel, every time something went wrong with it, it was a thousand bucks. I mean, yeah. every time like a like a new radiator hose, like a little radiator hose was a thousand bucks to get fixed. Yeah, and I'm like. How in the hell can these people afford these trucks? So that, that's mm -hmm. why I went back with a gas truck. Right. But but yeah, it, I I don't necessarily get on the whole EMP, you know, and and they're gonna start nuking us and stuff like that. I just don't get on that bandwagon too much. A 74 power wagon. That would be sweet. <laughs> that would be, man. Oh yeah. yeah. That, you could actually work on that. Yes. It's got spark plugs. Yeah, I tell you, I had a uh, 2003 uh, GMC uh, three quarter ton HD with a six liter. Mm -hmm. Hey, there's Lawrence. Lawrence is in our group. He's one of the guys that I could call him right now, and he would be down here in about 20 minutes because he lives yeah. about 20 minutes away. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I had that, and, and I put way over 300,000 miles on it, and I sold it to one of my buddies, and he's still driving the thing. I think he's got 400-something thousand miles on that truck. Yeah. And it, it looks sharp as can be. Yeah, you can't you can't go wrong, man, with uh, some of the older older rigs. They just continue to run, you know. Um, what – what? Um, I saw that you'd done a post the other day, and it was it was talking about – this whole controversy about Bud Light and Target and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, and that's, it's something I, I keyed in on because I, I occasionally go on a TikTok and I, I sit there and I flip through it at night when I feel like just being stupid, <laughs> wasting my time. Right. Yeah. But, but it's, it comes up in your feed and you, and you kind of go, what's going on here. Right. And, Oh yeah. Um, so, so what's, what's your take on that whole thing? I know a lot of people have been talking about, you know, Bud Light and, and Target and what they've been doing with, with all this, this stuff, but what's your take I, on all that? My, my whole thing is, and I've always said it, you know, it, do what you want to do. It's your life. You're the one that's got to an answer for it in the end. So, I mean, if you want to be uh whatever you know if, if you want to shit in a litter box and meow like a cat i mean go for it but don't don't bring it over here and show tell my kids that it's okay so that that's my stance on it uh but i think the whole agenda they're just trying to push it down your throat honestly it's like you know you've you've got to recognize that this is what we are and we're oppressed and everything else it's like dude i'm not oppressing you you can do whatever you want to with it you know uh, but just don't bring it to my house and tell my children that it's okay. You know, mm -hmm. I, it's not my problem. So as far as, you know, what you're doing, you know, but you, you kind of got to speak with your pocketbook and it's funny to see, I think target dropped uh, $9 billion in a stock value or something like that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Holy cow. And it's, it's funny to see all these women and you see all the TikToks and the Facebook stuff. It's like, you know, the guy sitting in the SUV and it's like, holy cow, my wife's been in Target for, you know, three hours. And then it's like she comes out with five hundred dollars of stuff. There's really women that do that stuff that, you know, that they go to Target to get a pack of toilet paper and they leave with three hundred dollars of crap they don't need. Mm -hmm. Those women are diehard Target people. And they, they're going to Walmart now. And it's like Target screwed the pooch on that big time. So Yeah. Well, what do you think what do you think the reason for those corporations doing that is? I heard one guy say that a lot of these big companies have tons of cash on hand and their stock prices keep going up. And they're like, we're gonna have to pay out money to the stockholders and uh stuff like that so they're like we're gonna tank the stock we're gonna do some stupid shit tank our stock and then everybody sells the stock and then they buy it back cheaper and then they don't have to pay that out hmm. so yeah that's, I, i'm I, not a financial guy i don't know how that works that's what i've heard either that or i think they've got some blood some dirt on the ceos yeah i think that's a possibility. it's an interesting interesting theory um they 
I, I've heard some things because I looked into it because of all this, this, hub, you know, the hubbub about it. And I was just kind of like, well, why would they do this? Because obviously nothing happens at a corporate level. Nothing happens at that level without some real thought behind it. Somebody had to make that decision that we're going to put this person out front as a spokesperson. And we understand that it's going to cause some some controversy. They have to know that they're not just doing it because they want to be, you know, politically correct or woke. And when I started looking into it, there's there's some folks that are saying that, you know, it's tied to CEI and ESG, which I I fully believe that to be true. And CEI, I wrote wrote down what it is, and it and it's basically it stands for Corporate Equality Index, and yeah. they they have to meet a certain score to get like their their funding or whatever whoever's funding all this stuff. But I understand as well that ESG, which is something that has been talked about for I've I've been clued in on it for at least two and a half years ESG, and. They're now it's starting to be more of a thing, which is stands for environmental, social and governance. And and it's all based on a score as well, that these major corporations are going to have to start complying to to meet that they are environmentally friendly, that they are, (laughs) you know, socially responsible, that they have all these scores that, you know, meet with governmental standards and. it's something that's going to be more mainstream, more corporations. I think you're going to start to see like push out like this sort of agenda. And when everybody's doing it, what's the answer to that? The answer, the only answer really is if you don't want to do business with those companies, you need to be able to establish a counter economy. Yeah. Because if everybody's doing it pretty soon, it's going to be like, well, where else am I going to go? Amazon's doing it. Walmart's doing it. Kroger's doing it. All of these major entities are going to be forced into this. And what we're seeing now is just the tip of the iceberg, I believe. But it's just one of those things that every generation gets exposed to something that's a little bit bit edgy at the time. But guess what? Mm -hmm. In in the generation or two, it's just be commonplace. So oh, yeah. I don't know. It's just an interesting, interesting thing to kind of observe from the outside. Yeah. Like I say, I'm not in in any way trying to like overthink it. I just I just find it interesting when the next little thing that pops up on your screen is something that everybody's talking about. And a lot of it is just a distraction. It's just. To, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's shiny a thing over here. Don't, don't pay attention to what's really going on. Shiny yep. thing over here. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. And that, that whole credit score and stuff like that. I mean. Yeah, it, it's building that counter economy. Shopping instead of buying your soap at Walmart or Target, call Shelly and get soap from Shelly. I mean, do that. You know, get instead of going and buying eggs from Walmart, find if you don't have chickens yourself, find your neighbor or a guy down mm-hmm. the road. Buy the chickens from him. He's he doesn't have you know he doesn't dress his chickens up as trannies or anything like that. So buy buy your chickens from him. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm. My wife gets to me sometimes. She's like, how can you be so politically incorrect and still be in business? And I'm like, I work for myself. I don't answer to anybody. I mean, yeah. and some of the stuff, I, I'm politically incorrect as you can come. I mean, I, I I get crazy thoughts in my head. And I'm like, I know I shouldn't say this in public because it's going to offend somebody. But I usually spout it off anyway and go on about my day. But Yeah, but I guess that's the unfortunate part about the, the social aspect of, of media is that certain things that you say will wind up, you know, coming back to bite you. Um, and that's unfortunate because we should all be able to express ourselves openly yeah. and exchange ideas, despite the fact that we may not agree with what either side is saying. I think that's oh, yeah. something that's lost and, and it's, it's unfortunate, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing that, man. We're making our own soap. We're selling our own, you know, we're selling five dozen eggs to a local deli every week, yeah. you know. So it's it's one of those things that you need to be able to find the ways to it. it it's just the little things, but those little yeah. things add up. Oh, and yeah, exactly. people that are doing it because we can talk about it all day. We can talk about the things that we should be doing, but 
it's it's really we have to do it. So that's awesome, man. That is awesome. I was just looking at the my comments really aren't coming through. I can't hardly see anything. So you have to tell me for something good. Then so. what's you can't see the comments? Now, I don't know why they're they're not popping up real good. There's one. Oh, Rick says he's only bought local mom and pop for 30 years. That's yeah. that's the way to do it. Yeah, if you can find those places, you know, I, I try to support places, you know, even if it's more money, because yeah. that's who's going to be there when you're not able to get it some other way because your thing's been cut off or whatever. Yeah. And I don't know, it, maybe we don't see that just right around the corner, but a generation from now, you have to think beyond just your immediacy. You have to think about your children and, and possibly their children. What's it going to look like? Yeah. That's well, the interesting question because we're all thinking about ourselves, but what's it going to look like for them? And we're, yeah. we're in a position now to understand like what we see coming and for us not to vigorously act upon that, I think is somewhat of a, at least in my way of thinking, I'm a failing. It would be a failing on my part not to act in some way, you know, oh, yeah. and recognize that. So, well, it's just the we've got a uh, it's Rich Pond Hardware. They uh, they sell fences, supplies, hardware, all that stuff. It's a mom and a pop thing. The guy that owns it lives like five miles from the store. He is one of the cheapest guys for fencing supplies around. I mean, it's crazy. You know the uh, the sixteen foot poplar boards they use for the uh, horse fence. Hmm. Like uh, the four plank horse fence, yeah. he buys like two semi loads at a time and sells them just like that. I mean, people come from all over, and he's the cheapest guy around. I mean, it's it's crazy. And you're most of the time you think, oh, this little bitty place is going to be way more expensive than Tractor Supply or something like that. But go in there and price it, and man, he beats the snot out of Tractor Supply on fencing supplies. Hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, man. Tractor Supply is a rip, man. I mean, there's yeah. You can, that's probably about the cheapest you're going to get chicken food unless you go to a mill or something like that, or you're buying it local from somebody who can get it for you for cheaper or bulk. But yeah. um, man, their other stuff, man, is through the roof, man. Cause, cause we've got a Harbor freight right across the street. Yeah. And it's like, it's like a fourth of the price, oh, you know? Yeah. In fact, one lady, I saw one lady the, the other day come into uh, tractor supply. She's all frantic. She's like, she asked the person at the cashier, she's like, where are your tarps? You know? And, and the lady's like, oh, there's, there's, if there's some, they're back there, you know, and then she starts walking away and I, and I wound up getting out of line cause I was going to check out, but I thought I'd hook her up and I walked up to yeah. her and I go, Hey, if you want tarps, go walk right across the street to Harbor Freight. They've got everything you need over there. Yeah. And it's a quarter of the price. She's like, really? You're oh. a badass. <laughs> and, she took off and, and she was like, I mean, she was like frantic. I don't know what was going on, but she needed tarps, you know? And I was just like, I couldn't let her spend money there, dude. It's like, it's right across the oh, street. Yeah. And it's yeah. all still coming from China. So what's the difference, right? Oh yeah. It's all made in the same factory in China. I guarantee it. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we're just like the chicken feed. Uh, what little chicken feed we buy for our chickens. Uh, I buy from the local meal that's, you know, six or seven miles away. This guy, he's a full-time farmer, but he bought the feed mill to keep it open. So most of the grain that he uses for his feed comes out of his out of his fields, which is pretty cool. Nice. So, nice. But you ought to be you ought to be feeding your your animals for free as much as you can. I mean, you, man, you do a bunch of that. You bet. You bet. So, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to do a talk uh, if we've got time at the festival about feeding your animals for free. So, cause we're doing, we're pretty much feeding our pigs and our chickens for free. I would say 98% of the time, the chickens and the pigs are eating for free. So, yeah, very so good. I want to do, a, I want to do a quick little talk on that for anybody that's interested at the festival. Yep. Mo most of it, you just got to ask the question. That's all. I mean, it's, yeah. it's out there and people, you just have to get out there and make those contacts and be a little bit persistent, be a little bit thoughtful as far as, the times in which you're going to approach people and then just put yourself out there that, you know, um, you're, you're doing it not necessarily to feed your animals, but you know, you're doing it to compost and it looks a oh, little yeah. bit more, more green and people are more willing to accept that. But um, California is an, an interesting place because it's very difficult 
for that to happen because unlike a lot of other places, I mean, a lot of that stuff's already spoken for. California actually uh, gives the schools grants. They give the schools grants for um, all the composting stuff that they're going to need, and, and which is great. They allow the, the kids to build, you know, garden boxes and, and composting and all of this. And they, you know, these tumblers that they compost all their kitchen scraps in. So all that stuff's spoken for. And our local waste management goes around and teaches the schools, all of that stuff. So the schools are all locked up. A lot of the restaurants have been um, um, tied in as well. So it's a little bit more difficult in my area. But like I say, I'm, I've am i got some really great connections out here. And it's just, again, you just have to be persistent if you, oh, if yeah. that's what you want. Yeah, I mean, um, got, I've got one place that almost every day I get about a 30-gallon trash can full of food scraps. Yeah. And it's like clockwork. I just run in there every day on my way in from come from work, coming home. And just grab it and the guy i provided him two trash cans and then a whole box of drum liners and yeah he usually texts me he's like he'll, he'll text me almost every day hey i've got a full can so you know almost every day we're getting about 30 gallons of stuff that we feed the pigs and the chickens and they that's, absolutely that's love the way it. to do it that's the way to do it no 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 way no way to see that stuff going into a landfill if we can if we can utilize it Oh, uh, yeah. Gr Grumpy Grumpy was saying that uh, when they say we aren't going to do something, they're lying. That is exactly what they're going to do eventually. Oh, that's, yeah. that's very true. But what's also true is that they tell us what they're going to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of that stuff is telegraphed. All of the mm -hmm. stuff that they're doing and implementing now, it's all been stuff that they've been talking about for years. And people oh, have yeah. just kind of been like, ah, whatever, you know, digital dollar, you know, all of this yeah. stuff, ESG, uh -huh, whatever, you know, you'll eat bugs and, you know, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to, they're telling you what they're going to do. So it's just, it's an incumbent upon people, I think, just to be a little bit more, you know, aware if that's something that concerns them. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> look at China. Yeah, man. I Right. W what isn't? Go yeah. go into any Walmart or Sam's Club, and and go find me some American products. There's very little. I, you know, one thing I'm surprised putting that fence up. All these T posts are made in the USA. I was very surprised of that. Mm -hmm. So I figured it was a bunch of cheap Chinese steel, but it's all American made T post. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was very cool. Yeah. Um. You know, we got. Um, you know, people probably wouldn't think that that's the case here in California, but I mean, there's plenty of places that sell ammo that are just local, you know, feed stores and hardware stores. And, you know, we've got the the dip. The problem is in California is that you have to run a background check just to buy ammo, yeah. which is lame. They want their dollar and then they want to put you in the system showing, oh, this person just bought 500 rounds. Oh, they just bought more of this. They just bought, which is lame. You know, and people in other states don't have to deal with that. But that's just something that in California we've had to deal with for a long time with regard to firearms sales and, and you know, buying ammo or buying firearms in general. I mean, we have to go we have to get a permit to be a concealed uh, carry weapons holder. And, you know, we go through training and, and all that stuff. We have to be recertified every two years. The state gets their cut for that money. Right. We have to go. Oh, yeah. In and demonstrate that we can safely use a gun. Our, our, our magazines are limited to, to 10 rounds, right? Yeah. So it's just, it's, there's a difference there. We still have our, our 2A, but it's more restrictive. And I it's a new only assume that through time, through generations that will go by, it, it, will, it will migrate just as everything does with regard to government. It just kind of never ceases to, to keep taking more so oh yeah they'll, they'll finally whittle it down where you get a single shot 22 and you can have five bullets for it and that's i got it. one of those man that was my first that was my first <laughs> rifle my dad bought me a single shot oh yeah I, i've got a little uh single shot cricket sitting here in the corner of the office so i bought that for my i bought that for my oldest son when he started shooting and uh then it's been handed down to my youngest one now and uh i keep it down here in the shop that's what i use for dispatching pigs it works mm. great for that yeah so 
Right on. Um, oh, hey, b- before I forget, we do have uh, Saturday night at the festival. We have a charity dinner that we're going to do. All our all our speakers will be there. All our presenters will be there. Uh, some of our sponsors are going to be there, and it's a uh, charity event. We're going to have a limited number of tickets for that dinner, so you'll get to eat dinner with uh, the speakers and presenters and some of the sponsors there. It's open to the public. You can buy tickets for it. We don't have it on the website yet, but this week we will have it because I just got word that our charity is good to go, and the charity is uh, Vets for Child Rescue. Is who we're going to be donating the money to. So we, we've been talking to them for about a month and they were like, we would be honored for y'all to do a charity event for us. Yeah, so cool. that charity event will have a limited number of people there that can buy tickets, but the proceeds for it are going to go to Vets for Child Rescue. Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah, Evan. That's cool, man. That is very cool. What's up, Evan? Welcome Evan to might Black, man. make it. Evan might make it. It depends on if he keeps that class or not. Uh, Evan's got a class scheduled uh, the weekend of our event, but he said he didn't know if he'd make it up or not. So we're yeah. still in limbo about Evan. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, there's there's uh, a lot of different ways we can obtain information. Where do you get your news? I mean, do you get it off of YouTube? Do you get it off of TikTok? Do you get it off of mainstream media? Do you listen to the radio? Where do you get... Like you, obviously we hear about things, right? You'll, you'll bing, you'll hear something. And then yeah. where do you, where do you go to validate that information? Where do you go to research and say, is this bullshit or is this something that I actually need to be concerned with? Where, where's your go-to? It, it might be corny, but I get a lot of it from YouTube. I mean, some of the people that I watch on YouTube have already looked at the information, verified it. And the, the guys, I've whittled it down. There's some guys that are on there every day. You know, the world, the world's going to end tomorrow. And there's one guy that is from Canada that we won't talk about, but every day, every nobody, day for the last. Nobody missed you talking about. Why are you beating around the bush, man? You need to be more specific. <laughs> what Canadian prepper. If you oh, listen to him, oh, that guy. If that you guy. listen to him, the world is ended Every day for the last 10 years, it's like, buy these five things or you're going to die in the apocalypse. And he's had the same shit for 10 years. And it's like, yeah, damn, dude, this gets old. But some of the people that I listen to, that they verified it. They're not doing the whole fear mongering deal. You know, that a lot of the guys on YouTube, you know, it's all fear monger stuff just to get clicks on it and everything. But the guys that I listen to on YouTube and, and look at on TikTok and stuff like that, it's like they verified the information and they're not gonna they're not doing it just to sell me a bug out bag. So they're they're doing it to actually inform you. Who, who so might that be that, if you're willing to say? Uh well I listen to your stuff, but you you just got you don't do a whole lot of the new stuff. Uh I listen to Billy's pimp cast, every every one of his pimp casts. I listen to it. He does good news, bad news. And uh, Billy's not doing the fear game. So he's not doing that. Uh, Grumpy throws a lot of good information out on uh, his lives and just his little shorts and stuff. I know Grumpy's not going to play the fear game on you. Uh, I listen to Bear Independent quite a bit. Uh, but it's it, sometimes it gets in a little fearish, but stuff like that. But a lot of the stuff, it's just like, hey, this is what happened. This is the facts on it. Uh, I listen to Man in America. I listen to his podcast sometimes on YouTube. Mm -hmm. He kind of gets in there and is like, hey, this is what happened. This is what might happen. So there's some stuff like that. And I'll I'll pick and choose some stuff on Facebook. Because on Facebook, the people that I'm friends with on Facebook, there's a reason. I don't just, I get friend requests all the time. And I'm like, Hey, I don't know who the hell you are. I'm not really going to do the whole friend thing. Just to have 8,000 friends on Facebook. But some of my friends on Facebook will see something on there and they'll post it and it'll come into my feed and then I can look at it. You know, they're in the same mindset as I am. Just like one of the big things now is they're going to outlaw uh, June 11th is the uh, animal antibiotics to where you have to have a prescription for that. 
Yes, mm. Warrior Poet. I listen to him sometimes. But like, there's a lot of people that are up in arms about June 11th. The pre all these antibiotics are going to be prescription only by the vet. So people are like, holy crap, what am I going to do? That's been going on for like the last six years they've been trying to do that. It was passed, I think, six or seven years ago. I think Obama's the one that passed that. And it's just taken this long to take effect. So, but I'll look at that. People are looking at stuff, some of my friends that think of the same way I do. So if they bring something up, it's probably something I should look at. So, but mainstream media, Fox, I, I hadn't looked at Fox in years. I mean, any of the mainstream media stuff, I just, I'm like, they're lying to you anyway. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's Fox, CNN, NBC. It's they're all in. They're all owned by the same company, so they're going to tell you all the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a sad thing, man. You know, I, I don't know. It's it's would be nice to to have something coming through that's not coming through somebody else's filter. But yeah. that's that's not how human beings work. You know, oh, even yeah. even people who you trust. You know, you're getting it from their perspective and their spin and they're telling you what it is that they want to get across to you. So it's coming through somebody else. And really, the only way that you can verify anything is if you were actually there and you lived through it. That's yeah. really the only way that you can verify. Otherwise, it's coming through as told by someone else. And I've like like you, I've lost a lot of faith because the credibility um, it, it's just been lost. It's been shattered with regard to how they've conducted themselves in, in the media. And it's, man, it, it, it happened quick. It happened oh, real yeah. quick because it wasn't that many years ago where they actually were somewhat in my eyes, not as biased, not as, you know, this side versus that side. And just, they're still just all playing to the, the same message, but they're yeah. one side's good, good cop, bad cop. You know, and it's just, oh, man, it's just super maddening. But, yeah, it's interesting. I, I I don't pay a lot of attention to it. I don't really talk about it a lot. I think it's good to be be informed. But, again, I let other people be the ones who are going to be the town criers and yeah. give, me, give me the daily brief. And yeah. then if I think that, you know, there's something of, you know, that has validity, I'll, I'll look into it or further or if it's something I can – you know, I have an interest in, but man, oh, yeah. it's just well, totally so maddening. One, the news cycle is maddening. One, one old guy told me one time when I was in college, he said, don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. And he said, if you do that, you'll be a better person. Yeah. And if you really think about it, it's like, that's true. So, and another guy and people will call me quacky, but I listen to Alex Jones sometimes. Hmm. And Alex Jones, everybody's like, he's a stinking nut job. But by God, a lot of stuff he said has come true. Yeah. So I, I still think he's a little half nuts, but I still listen to him sometimes. Yeah, I think he probably goes a little too far in some some respects. And, you know, you have to, like, be able to filter that out. But, you know, that's one of the reasons why he's he's been targeted is because he does spew a little bit of the truth, you yeah. know, to the point where it stings the people that don't want the truth spoken yeah. of. So. I think it's yeah. There's there's plenty of ways to get your info out there, but man, it's it, the media landscape is just it's an incredible thing. Oh <laughs> I'm yeah, so and just, I mean, just with it, you know. And honestly, it's as trashy and as nasty as some of the stuff is on TikTok. If you start looking at some of the right people and following some of the right people, like uh, when Title Forty Two expired, there were people down there on the border that were shooting stuff and like, Hey, this is what's happening. And this is what the news is showing you. This is not really what's going on, what the news is showing you. And TikTok doesn't really filter a lot of that stuff. I mean, if you, if you want to show some naked girl, they're going to take you down on TikTok, but they're, they're letting you talk about stuff that other platforms won't let you talk about period. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if they, if some of those people put stuff up on other platforms, it would get yanked down so fast it'd make your head spin. But TikTok lets it stay on there. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting that that TikTok and and the reels and and all of that sort of stuff because it if you allow it to, it can just suck you in just like that. 
And next thing oh, you know, yeah. you're burning brain cells. Yes. You know, like in the evening, if you just don't want to do anything, you just want to check out, you know, you know, whatever, turn on TikTok and you're just like sitting there going, oh, what am I doing? You know, I need to go oh, yeah. to sleep. And, and, it, and it's a, it's amazing some of the trash that people will put on TikTok. And you look, I always click, you know, if somebody's doing something totally stupid and it's like, I wonder how many followers this person has. And you click on it and there's, there's 800,000 people watching this stupid woman do something. Mm -hmm. And it's like, like I clicked on something. There's some woman down in Tennessee. All she does is talk about stupid stuff. And she's got like 800,000 followers. Hmm. And like the video that popped up, she was like, my husband said I couldn't drive his truck. She's like, I'm going to show him I can drive his truck. And she went out there and got this truck. She was like, this thing's got some glove plugs or something. I got to warm up or this and that. And she's like, they ain't no damn keys in the truck. She's like, he knew I was going to try to drive his truck. And, and I'm like, and I click like a million people have watched this stupid video. And she's got 800,000 followers. And I'm like, people watch this shit. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Interesting times we're in. I, 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 I continually say that because um, I don't know. I guess that just means I'm getting to be an old guy. You know, I, I guess I'm an old guy too. Yeah, because it's you know start to sound like your your parents, I guess. But <laughs> interesting times is all I can say, man. Hey, so let me just switch gears on you real quick, and then we'll we'll get out of here. But right. I want to know what what your plans are. Do you have any big plans for 2023 on your homestead? Are you looking to start any new projects? Are you looking to add any new livestock? Or is there anything pressing that you're going to be working on? Well, we got. Uh, this weekend, I ran about uh, 400 foot of high tensile fence up on a property line. Uh, ran it, got it finished, because uh, I'm trying to get that done. And then I've got one other stretch of fence to do, and the property's totally enclosed on the perimeter. So then I can let, if I want to, I can let my livestock guard dogs have the whole run of the property at night if I want to do that. But I'm trying to get another grown up, there's a grown up section uh, that we're just not doing anything with and I'm going to let the uh, animals go in there and clear it up for me. So mm -hmm. that's one of the big projects. Another big project, we are going to put in a greenhouse here in the next little bit. So the plans are in the works. Uh, we're trying to decide if we want to do a hoop house or actually build like a real cool greenhouse, like out of wood and windows and all that kind of stuff. So I'm letting my wife decide which one she wants because it's going to be close to the house. So that's that's probably one of the biggest projects we'll do this year is a greenhouse. Is that going to be a group build? A group build? Yeah, you're going to be doing like an Amish barn raising and get your hats on? and. I don't know. It's not going to be that big a greenhouse. So okay. It, it, it'll be a smaller greenhouse just to start stuff and maybe have some uh, cold weather plants in there. Uh yeah. If I had more room, I would do a huge hoop house, but I've still got to keep some front yard for the kids to play. They'd be pissed off if I put, you know, a hoop house in their front yard. Yeah. But, uh, but no, it, it'll probably be something I do in the afternoons and on the weekends. Some of the guys might come by and help and do some yeah. stuff like that. But that's probably the biggest plan. Uh, no, no more future animals right now. We're pretty much at capacity. So, and, yeah. uh, but that's that's really all the big plans. Getting that new area fenced off and stuff like that. And it's like like my neighbor. I was fencing the other day down by the driveway, and he walks out, and it's funny. He's like, "Hey, what are you doing?" I was like, "Putting some fence up." He goes, "You gonna run some livestock out there?" And I wanted to be like, "No, you dipshit. I'm just out here killing myself putting fence up for the fun of it." I'm like, "What kind of moron are you?" Yeah. Hey. Yeah, Lawrence is gonna build him a greenhouse. Lawrence will be down here now. Lawrence, he's a he's a mason, so he's probably gonna build him a, a brick greenhouse. So, yeah. Uh, well, real yeah, real cool, man. Yeah, you've, you've, got, you've got a a pretty big slate for twenty twenty three. Obviously, you've got the festival coming up here in October, and we talked about that a little bit earlier. And for those who are joining the broadcast later, you can go to the earlier part of the video and we talked about what's going to be taking place in Bowling Green at uh, the later part of October of this year. 
Um, the festival is going to be held uh, October 27th, 28th, and 29th. We've got classes that are going to be held on the 27th, which is a Friday. And then those are sign up and they're a paid class. And uh, the following two days is going to be free admission to the expo itself. Yeah. And um, I've got links to all of that stuff in the description of this video. So if you want, you can easily just go on there and check that out. But I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight. We had a pretty lively uh, group of folks in the chat. That was pretty cool. And um, anything else you want to add, Jason? Uh, so I, I appreciate everybody being in chat. I couldn't see my chat was not coming through for some reason. But yeah, that's I, weird. I, I pre yeah, I, I appreciate everybody in chat and all the comments and stuff like that. And and I can't wait. I, I mean, it's the festival's a few months off as it is, but I'm I'm still stoked and excited about it. And uh, honestly, this would not be pulled off if it wasn't for Shelly at Two Old Crows and Jake at Dog Creek Farms. So I mean, they've been us three are doing it, and we're all doing our part. And it's it, it, it's a lot to get a festival going, and I hope we have a huge attendance. And it, it's going. There's going to be something for everybody. You can bring, it's going to be a kid friendly thing. We're working on a home with a, a homeschooling group and they're probably going to do some kids activities. So it's not, it's not going to be just, you know, the husband and wife can come or just a man can come. There's going to be stuff for men, women, and kids to do there. So yeah. don't think that just because you've got kids, you can't come to this. Kids are welcome to come. There's going to be tons of stuff for them to do there too. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those things that, you know, people have to make the decision for themselves whether or not they want to commit to going to something like this. But there's, you know, I can speak from firsthand experience of having made the decision to go to Self-Reliance Festival. And I'm from California and I drove from California out to Tennessee because there was people out there that I wanted to get, you know, to meet in person. And I will just say that there's there's no better opportunity to make those sorts of connections if you make them in person. You're going to actually up up the game as far as relationship wise because yeah, no doubt. it's easy to sit on the sidelines and and you know have interactions through the computer. But there's no better opportunities to get out there and meet some people. I got an opportunity to meet Jason there. I've met Jason twice now. Um, because I've been to Self-Reliance Festival twice and got an opportunity to meet him. I'm going to be going back out to Bowling Green in October, and I hope to see, um, you know, those that want to come out there, I'd be glad to meet you and, you know, have an opportunity to chat. So, um, again, oh, yeah, thank you, right? Yeah, and, and it's funny. Uh, Billy, Billy said on his uh, pimp cast the other day, he went to Greg Judy's grazing school. And uh, he said he met somebody. He went from North Carolina to Missouri, traveled that far, and met somebody that was 15 or 20 minutes away from him. And he was like, I probably would have never met the dude if I wouldn't have went. So, I mean, you're going to meet people, even if you're coming in from Virginia. You'll probably meet somebody from Virginia that's, you know, 20 minutes down the road. So, yeah. Skane's girl needs to come. She's in everything. She needs to make the trip and get out. I know. Here. I know. She she said she's not coming. Lord, well, I don't know. I don't know what her deal is. She's she's busy. Need, I guess. I guess she's we need to just block Louisiana, Louisiana's too far. From what Louis, I Louisiana's not too far. <laughs> I mean, you're coming from California. I know. It was a nice drive. You know that it only took me like three days one way. <laughs> it was a nice drive. You get to see all that flyover country that everybody talks shit about, you know, people yeah. that, are, that are all uppity. They talk shit yeah. about the flyover country. I think it's pretty nice. <laughs> so, well, anyhow, grumpy, I appreciate it, you guys. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, well, cool, cool. Um, we'll end the broadcast here tonight. But again, thank you, everyone. And um, we'll see you again next week.